See, Shebna was concerned about getting himself into the kingdom. Elikam, listen to this. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the house of Judea. I want you to let this sink in. I, I, I talk pretty uh, blunt about my family. My dad, uh, I can count maybe on one hand, probably a couple fingers, how many times my dad said he loved me. He just wasn't that kind of a guy. He was tough. He was marine. He was just, I mean, jarhead. Remember Clint Eastwood? What movie was that? That was my dad. I mean, he literally would wake us up with a horn. I mean, he was just ridiculous. And he was completely different than I was and am. I don't know what mold he was cut from. He, he was a part of that generation. I've seen a couple other guys like that. But dad loved to work. That's what he, I mean, that was what he did. Like he would work 50 hours a week, sometimes 60 at UPS. He would come home exhausted and say, oh, I'm just wore out. I'm going to go change oil. I was, like, I was like, dude, you are weird, you know? Because that is not me, you know? That was him, you know? Saturday, it's going to be great. What do you do? We're going to mow the lawn. I'm like, yeah, woo it's going to be great. You know? I mean, that's what my dad liked to do. He would go cut wood, and, and he, would, he would work. I haven't figured that out yet. I thought maybe I would turn, like, you know, 40, and I'd be like, wow, I'm a machine now. Hadn't happened. I'm still lazy. I hate to work, okay? I, th- that's, that was how my dad was. Very manly, very, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe you had a dad, like the dad was just very work-oriented, just loved to do that, getting his hand dirty and all that kind of stuff. Um, very different than me. And I was very uh, open and, and affectionate as a young kid. And he was very calloused and stern and be tough and all of that. And, but there was one time where fatherhood showed through in him. It was on a Saturday. It was in the fall. I was probably seven or eight. We were cleaning the garage. We had the cleanest garage in the state of Indiana. Okay? I'm serious. It was a uh, concrete garage, but it had, over the years, or whether he poured it like this, it was slick. I mean, and it might have been because he did clean it with a, a toothbrush, but, I mean, it was just a slick, just, I mean, mirror finish garage floor. And he would, uh, our cars, we had old junky cars, and uh, it would leak oil, and he would go out there, and, and he'd pour kerosene on it so it wouldn't stain. He would scrub it really good, and then he'd put kid litter, and then after we get all that soaked up, then he'd put Dawn on it. We'd put the water and scrape it in the squeegee, and every week we did that, right after we mowed the lawn. And so that was our time together. It was a big time. And um, one Saturday, it was in the fall, Dad's scrubbing, doing, he would do the kerosene thing, and I'm up against the wall. Uh, garage door is here. Uh, like the, going to the house, the, going to the garage was there. I was up against it. And uh, this is along the wall. And then right here was the furnace. And the wall went that way. And we had the old water well, the well, the pump. And we had the water softener going down that way. And then over here we had the bike racks and lawnmower and all that. So I'm sitting here against the wall watching Dad and he's scrubbing. And the last thing I remember hearing was... And then I felt heat and pressure. And it was this wall of fire uh, in between me and my dad. And uh, I didn't, they told me the story later, but he had screamed to my mom, get the door. My mom couldn't get the door open because of all the pressure of the fire. And uh, I mean, it was huge. And in fact, my mom's repainting the house and trying to get it sold where she got remarried to a great guy. My dad's no longer living. And, and um, they're selling now. The said so they repaint all that. And, and um, all inside the garage, on the wall, on the garage door, on that side of the wall, the ceiling, all that's all black. Except for one little place where it's like a picture of me right there on the wall. <laughs> no, that's right, right. But there's, you know, it's, it's all black right there. And um, so I'm sitting there and I can feel the heat and the fire and all that. And uh, again, I'm eight. Okay? And my dad in my mind was already this gigantic kind of tremendous superhero no one messes with, you know, they go to pick on you. Isn't your dad Joe? Sorry, kind of thing, you know. He was already like that in my mind. And uh, I'm in this situation, and the heat, and I see, I had to look up, and I see my dad. (laughs) I see my dad coming flying through the fire. And um, he grabs a hold of me, tucks me, wraps me up in this flannel, and then turns and runs right back through the fire goes out, sets me on the edge of, the, uh, of this old white Plymouth we had. And he's, uh, he has this look. I remember it 
like it was yesterday. He said, there's like a tear on his face and he's touching me and he's, he's feeling. And I remember so vivid, I could see his arms. They smelled like burnt hair and they were all shit, you know, it was all, you know, burnt all there. And, uh, and he looks at me, he goes, are you okay? And, and I was like, you ran through fire. <laughs> That's the coolest thing I ever seen. Wow. You know, it's like, like Superman. Wow. <laughs> it's like freaking out. And he was just like, yeah, he's fine. Uh, but he, he didn't think about that. And he was moved, and it was something we told at families, and he would hug me, and, and uh, that's, that's fatherhood. I, I tell teens this. I'm not old, like your pastor, okay? I'm not old. <laughs> but I'm saying things, okay? Seriously, I say things now because I'm a parent that I heard my parents say. You will never know what it's like to be a dad or a mom until you have kids of your own. Uh, the stuff that they say that I, I can't go to sleep at night until I, I hear the door close and I know you're home. That just is never going to resonate with you until you have a kid of your own. When we're talking about parent, okay, even it's, that's so ingrained, it's so ingrained in, in, in humanity that even at the most depraved level, some, there's some of that is still there. I mean, even in the most ungodly people, fatherhood and motherhood, is, it's some, it's de- how, however, how deep you have to go, it's most of the time evident. But even in the most worst, it's still there. It's this, my, it's my, hey, my kids come before me. You, you see what I'm saying? That's real strong in Christianity, obviously. But when he, it, it amazes me, folks, you get this. This is so impactful to me that when God's talking about the way that this guy was going to look at his stewardship and the people in which God had put in his life, he was going to look at them in the way that a father looked at a child. In other words, it wasn't about him. It was about them. That was what my dad did. See, my dad, he didn't even, and the stories that we told was, he didn't even think about it. He just, it was instinctual. That's what he did. I mean, it wasn't, that's fatherhood. See, it wasn't like dad was like, Jeremiah. Well, he's not coming out. We can have another one. I mean, I guess, you know. You know that, that's not fatherhood. It's I don't, hey, what? Don't mess with my kids. Don't mess with my kids. It's that kind of urgency. And that's going to, listen, that colors the tone of this guy's focus on those who need a shepherd in the kingdom. He's going to look at them. Now, you understand, Jesus, again, fulfilled this. The language that's used to describe this guy, it's used to describe Jesus in our passage. He goes on in verse 22, and he says, I will place on his shoulder, which is actually the word holds. We, you and I think of hold. Jesus holds the key. He opens doors. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, it has to do with the door into the kingdom. But literally, holds is not with your hand. It's bears. This, listen to this. This guy took on his shoulder the responsibility for your salvation. So much so that Jesus says, I won't go so they can go. That's evangelism. That's how Jesus feels about me. Jesus said, you are going to make it. One of the most fun, and we're going to get to this explicitly tomorrow night. But one of the things that is amazing about Christianity is God, and, we, and we've talked about this all the time. You've heard people say, you have to forgive. If you don't forgive, you literally remain in bondage. You do. You don't, you, you can set barriers up. In fact, you need to put boundaries up in people's lives. But you can forgive. I forgive. It's not about them and even they're asking forgiveness. It's I don't give you that kind of authority over me. I forgive you. You say, where do we get that from? God. God forgave you while you were still yet sinning. And not in Christ. He forgave you. See, the message of the gospel is God comes and says, listen, you walked out of the intimacy and relationship that I created for you. This is my design. Looks like Jesus. This is how I created you to live. You walked away from that. You've been rebelling. I want you to know that I forgive you. I not only forgive you, but I have atoned for all of that. And I want, here's the message of the gospel. Just come back. Just come back home. That's Christianity. You don't have to do anything. Amen. Just come back home. Just come back home. That's it. You're like, well, I mean, don't just come back home. 
Just walk back into it. Let him be your dad. Let him father you. Let him mentor you. Let him save you. That's the message of the gospel. He's done everything he'll ever have to do in your life. There's nothing left yet to do. So the idea of fatherhood, again, that's, that's the, the epitome of that. Of that stewardship is seen in Jesus. So Jesus comes, and when he comes to Philadelphia, he's talking to them. This is so significant. He's talking to them about an open door. In fact, when you come down, and I honestly, and I'm not as smart, honestly, I'm not as smart as most scholars, obviously. But I was so disappointed. (laughs) Maybe they just didn't do their homework. Maybe they skipped that day when they did Philadelphia. But they came up with all these wild interpretations of what it means to open a door, you know. That Jesus is that he can close the door on you. That's, come on. He says, I have placed a door before you that no one can shut. In other words, Jesus says, listen, man, you are in. I've included for you. I have prepared a place for you. Get your name on the door. You are in. I want to be like this with you. I open a door that no one can shut. Not only for you, but there is a, and as you go down to the passage, it's a door of ministry. It's a door of being tight and participating with him in the kingdom. Okay? Everyone has a stewardship. You have a responsibility. You have a call. What it means to be a Christian is I walk back into intimacy with him and I'm launched into his perspective. I'm seeing as he sees and feeling as he feels. This is what he's talking about to the church in Philadelphia. That he's calling them to ministry. And what ministry is, is not a program. Ministry is not, uh, and, and ministry is feeding the homeless. But it's not just the program of feeding the homeless. Ministry is looking out at my neighbor and, f- and feeling about them the way that he feels about them. I, I would want to send my son and daughter to a school where the elementary teacher did not see her job as a job, but as a stewardship. Go, go home and Google this tonight. Did you know that an that a elementary school teacher spends more time with those kids than their own parents do? What would happen, Sunday school teacher, or excuse me, elementary school teacher, if you went to work every day, just 20 minutes early, walked by each desk and said, Jesus, I accept the spiritual responsibility of this kid. If they don't make it, you can come and talk to me about it. You can put it on my shoulders. What would happen? Someone did that for me. Someone did that for me. And it wasn't the family in California. It was my mammy. She prayed for me. Oh, my word. Her broken knees. (laughs) My fault. I live in conviction every time I'm around her. She's hobbling around, looking at me. I mean, she took it on the chin for me. What what would happen if you and I thought maybe we weren't here, that maybe this whole thing is just not about us getting into the kingdom, but what if you and I are here because you have a call upon your life and that your church, Grace Church the Nazarene, has a call for this community? I go to a lot of churches, and honestly, not not your church, obviously, honestly not. This is not one of those, I'm joking, not your church. This is not your church. (laughs) I've been to churches where um, they've got this mentality that they're just the small other Nazarene church in the town. And the church that's really doing the ministries across town, and we just gather, and we're doing our own little thing. We have our family, and we're just kind of, and I'm honest with them. I'm just like, well, then you're a waste of my time. (laughs) Keep the paycheck. I'm out of here. Because if you are not serving a purpose in the kingdom and a vital impact that God does not have a mission for this church, why are you here? Really, I mean, why do you exist? That God has a, God has a call upon your life. That he, he desperately, he's, he's literally, you are, you are the only Jesus that some people are ever going to see. Amen. Really. You're the only, I, I would not listen to a pastor, but God put a surfer in my life. God puts individuals in my life and they accepted the spiritual responsibility for me. That's holding the key of David. That Jesus comes to this church and says, listen, you, I have appointed you. I've put a call upon your life. That's the context.